So we, my name is Henry Jeffrey. I lead the Policy and Innovation Group at the University of Edinburgh, where we work at the, the interface of offshore renewable energy innovation and, and policy. So I'm delighted to be um, chairing this session this morning. I think it was interesting when we heard from Kirsty this morning on the importance that offshore renewables will have in the energy mix of the future, both in Scotland and the UK. And then we heard that very interesting presentation from Brian Seller as the keynote um, for the afternoon session on the importance of, of data and the role that it has in like taking innovations forward to allow us to understand the technologies as we move forward for those deployments for net zero in 2050 or hopefully um, before that. So we've got a really great session uh, this afternoon. We've got a, a range of, of speakers, uh, four speakers um, this afternoon. I'll uh, introduce each of them in, in turn and they have around 10 minutes to present and then we'll have around sort of, you know, three or four minutes for questions with the aim of being back in the, in the main room for the next keynote session at 25 past two. So I'll ask, ask all the speakers to try and keep to time and also for your questions to be sort of pertinent, short and efficient. Okay, so let's kick things off. Our first speaker is from um, Dundee University. University, um, Alessio Genko. Um, he's in the second year of his PhD and he's going to speak about rock anchors and their application in the tidal energy sector. So, um, Alessio, over to you. Okay, so hello, hello everyone. I'm Alessio Genko, a PhD student at University of Dundee, and my supervisors are Matteo Ciantia and Michael Brown from University of Dundee, Anne Ivanovic from University of Aberdeen, and Nick Reswell from Sustainable Marine Now uh, Swift Anchors, my industrial partnership. And today I'm going to talk about a numerical investigation of offshore rock anchors subject to the horizontal loading. In particular, I'm going to discuss about uh, GPFEM, what is GPFEM and why I have decided to use this numerical method, the calibration of the structured modificam clay model that I used to simulate the rock behavior, the rock anchor numerical model, the permeability influence on coupled hydromechanical simulation, future work and some conclusions. So GPFEM is a numerical method uh, based on uh, uh, is a geotechnical particle finite element method. It's a numerical method based on the continuum approach, where the continuum is modeled by using the update Lagrangian formulation. And it is a numerical method suitable for large strain applications in rock and suitable for uh, coupled hydromechanical problems. So here you can see two geotechnical applications. Oh, sorry to geotechnical application, a shallow footing in uh, soft rock, where you can, you can see uh, the localization of the failure mechanism in uh, soft rock, uh, thanks to the no local approach implemented in uh, GPFEM, and also another uh, uh, numerical uh, application, a pipeline soil interaction, where you can see the remeshing eff effect uh, suitable in uh, GPFEM. And uh, this numerical method involves also advanced uh, constitutive model. One of these is the structured modificam clay model that I used uh, to simulate rock behavior. And I calibrated this model uh, from uh, Borsnip and uh, <coughs> Beria Sandstone uh, experimental data from Young et al. 1996. And uh, as you can see in QP plot, there is a good agreement between experimental data and uh, numerical data uh, represented by the, the blue line, in this case the yield surface of this uh, uh, constitutive model. And I plotted the stress path for two consolidation uh, pressure related to drain triaxial test shown in Q epsilon axial and epsilon volumetric and epsilon axial. And you can see that there is a good agreement between experimental data and numerical data. Therefore, I obtained, due to the calibration procedure, the classic geotechnical properties, the elastic parameters, the yield surface parameters, the plastic potential parameter, and then the hardening parameters. Um, here you can see the object of my PhD project, the rock anchor, developed by uh, SME now, Swift Anchor, that is a groutless and steel-made 
uh, rock anchor suitable for uh, renewable offshore applications. And I simulated in this case, in this work, uh, um, the rock anchor lateral effect in a 2D plane strain condition, even though it's a 3D problem. And I used, in this case, a contact domain with a penalty approach, and I used an interface friction angle equal 30 degrees. And I used the structure modify cam clay already calibrated, and I changed the permeability value in order to assess this effect on the final response. And I applied a vertical displacement with a constant rate equal 0.01 meter per second, and the rate effect assumed an important role on the final response and lateral capacity. And I applied the water boundary condition at the end. And, and I assessed this permeability influence on rock anchor lateral response. So here you can see um, there is a problem in uh, animation, but anyway, um, I plotted the normalized lateral, ca lateral capacity with the vertical displacement, the evolution of the lateral capacity uh, with the vertical displacement, and also the uh, average of the incremental water pressure with the vertical displacement, and in general with different uh, permeability values. And uh, uh, basically, the re uh, by reducing the uh, permeability parameter, uh, there is an increasing in, uh, in the lateral capacity. And uh, you can see here uh, the tensile stress okay, that I plotted uh, to show the propagation of the failure mechanism. And uh, basically, the failure mechanism changed according to uh, the permeability value. I also plotted the normalized lateral capacity with the velocity normalized for the horizontal consolidation parameter. And uh, you can see that there is an undrain regime for uh, permeability value below 1E minus 12 meter per second as uh, permeability. And uh, therefore, there is uh, an important rate effect and permeability effect on the lateral uh, response where you can see, uh, by reducing the permeability, uh, the lateral capacity increase accordingly. Uh, I also plotted in the, this slide the, increment, the average of the, the incremental water pressure for two different permeability values, uh, the greatest, uh, 1E minus 5, and the 1E minus 15 meter per second. And you can see that there is a different uh, uh, distribution of the water pressure due to the effect of the permeability. And for 1E minus 5, there is a distribution of the water pressure, there is a suction just uh, below the rock anchor, whereas for uh, the permeability equal 1E minus 15 meter per second, there is a suction just around uh, the rock anchor. And it is important difference in terms of magnitude of uh, incremental water uh, pressure. Okay, so concluding, uh, numerical results obtained confirm the strong dependency of the permeability on the rock anchor lateral capacity. The GPFM numerical method suggests is an efficient solution to handle coupled hydromechanical problems, and the results reveal the influence of the rate effect and water pressure distribution uh, on the large strain rock anchor lateral response. About future work, I'm going to compare the numerical results with experimental data to obtain an accurate validation. I'm going to assess the rock anchor lateral response with the cyclic and uh, multidirectional loading condition, loading, loading condition that uh, represent a more realistic tidal effect. And I'm going to investigate the rock anchor response by using the classic PY uh, approach. Okay, thank you for the attention. Um, thank you very much, Alessio. Um, very interesting, and thank you very much for, very well. for keeping to time. Um, we do have some um, roving microphones, I hope. Um, so does anybody have a, um, a question for Alessio?
I'm sure you're all experts on the permeability of rock formations and are desperate to clarify something. Alistair. I know nothing about it at all, but, <laughs> but thank you for the presentation. Well, can you tell us a little bit about the applications that you think rock anchors will be really well suited for? Is this floating yeah. wind? Tidal yeah, floating uh, tidal, uh, tidal renewable energy. Okay. And, uh, it's a new concept uh, developed by SME, my industrial partnership. And uh, it's really useful because uh, it is possible to limit the cost of material and the uh, installation procedure is uh, efficient, really efficient. And it's a good point, an important point for these applications. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, the, just the rock anchor system is a steel made rock anchor. And, uh, it's, it's a really efficient uh, rock mm. anchor. So, and, and in this work, I simulated uh, the lateral response, but it is important to take in account also the pull-out capacity of this system. And uh, so far, I investigated, I investigated just uh, from a numerical aspect, but I'm going to compare uh, the lateral capacity and pull-out capacity with experimental and field test data. Okay, good. Um, sure, yeah, Brian. Uh, and maybe if you can just introduce yourself for your name and organisation. Okay, Thanks. so that was Alistair MacDonald from the University of Edinburgh, <laughs> and I'm Brian Seller from the University of Edinburgh, School of Engineering, both of us. <laughs> Thanks for the presentation. Um, how, how are you informing the input conditions? So when, what do you drive the models with? Do you have a good estimate of the, the flow speeds and... Um, or the turbulence or wave conditions or yeah, what, what drives the model that way? Yeah, so basically in this case I just simulated uh, a lateral loading condition by applying a vertical displacement. Just uh, uh, I have not taken account uh, the cyclic effect or, uh, or multidirectional effect that uh, indeed exhibited uh, uh, from uh, Tidal, but I'm gonna um, compare and investigate this in future work, but uh, it's, it's important uh, to take in account the permeability because this permeability and the rate effect and the velocity of this application change basically <coughs> the lateral capacity. So it's an important uh, geotechnical point, uh, this one. Okay, thank you. So I, I think um, we, can, we can move on, but thank you very much again, Liceo. So now moving from, from Tidal to, to Wave Energy and moving from, from Dundee to, to Edinburgh, our next speaker is one of my own students actually, um, Paul Kerr, who's going to tell us about um, screening processes for early stage innovative technology for the Wave Energy sector. Paul. You would have been able to grab the glass of water. Sorry. Yeah, for sure. Sorry for it. Um. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so thank you all for coming to, to listen to this. Um, so I'm going to be presenting some work that I've been doing um, on um, screening of early stage conversion technologies for wave energy applications. Um, I'm carrying this out, as he said, in his research group at the University of Edinburgh, and it's supported by uh, Wave Energy Scotland and the Energy Technology Partnership. Okay, cool. um, so I'm going to start off with um, giving you a quick introduction to why I'm carrying out the research and its overall aims. I'll then take you through um, the screening process that I developed. I'll show you the results from um, applying the process to six conversion technologies and then a quick discussion of the findings. Um, so <clears throat> the overall motivation for this work is that conventional wave energy is not yet commercially viable. In general, conventional devices have had issues around high cost, high complexity and low reliability. Direct conversion technologies, so these are um, conversion technologies which can directly convert mechanical to electrical energy through being stretched or strained, um, have multiple potential benefits when we're thinking about applying them in wave energy applications. These are things like low cost, low corrosion materials, direct generation, and the potential to design novel wave energy converters around them with things like distributed power takeoffs. However, there are several of these technologies proposed for potential use in wave energy, and we want to understand which of them actually have potential. Um, so to do this, I need a set of metrics and, a set and an assessment process that can be used to consistently compare and evaluate them. Sorry. 
So the overall aims of this work was to develop a process that can be used to screen these early stage technologies based on their fundamental applicability and wave energy. Then applying this process to a selection of conversion technologies. Um, so you can see on the left hand side of the screen here, the six conversion technologies that I looked at in this work. So these are dielectrical elastomers, dielectric fluid generators, piezoelectric ceramics, piezoelectric polymers, triboelectrics and magnetostriction. And then following on from this, I wanted to look at the R&D requirements for any of the successful technologies in the screening process when we're thinking about scaling them up to um, kind of large scale wave energy applications. Um, however, today's presentation just fo focuses on that initial screening stage. So um, assessment processes already exist um, in the wave energy sector. Um, however, this, these generally are focused around whole devices or arrays of devices. Um, so many of the aspects that they consider aren't applicable or quantifiable when we're thinking about an early stage um, conversion technology. So I had to come up with a set of parameters which could kind of serve as um, proxies for these overall requirements that actually can be measured at an early stage for these technologies. Um, so you can see the second um, column in the table here has the parameters that I chose to um, assess for these technologies. Um, I'll just take you through them um, in turn now. Um, and they're, they're arranged in two filters, which I'll also um, take you through in a second. So um, the first uh, parameter is conversion efficiency. This is simply the ratio of experimentally demonstrated electrical output energy over mechanical input energy. The second one is energy density. So this is the energy output per cycle you can get from the conversion technology per kilogram of its raw materials. The third uh, parameter is raw material cost per unit energy. So this is the cost of the conversion technology's raw materials divided by its energy density. Um, then the parameters that make up the second filter, the first one is through life energy density. So this is the total energy output you can get from the conversion technology over its lifetime. So this combines both the number of cycles to failure, so fatigue life, and the energy output per cycle. The second parameter in, in the second filter is through life energy costs. So this is the ratio of cost of raw material over the through life energy density. The third parameter in the second filter is through life embodied carbon. So this is the total um, embodied carbon in the conversion technology's raw materials divided by the through life energy density. And the last parameter um, is ultimate limit state. So while the first uh, three parameters in the second filter incorporate fatigue life, this looks at the conversion technology's ability to survive overloads um, based on its uh, material properties. Um, so where I could, I set cutoffs for these parameters which should indicate a minimum level of performance um, that's required to consider them for wave energy applications. Um, I don't have time to go through these cutoffs in the presentation, but they're meant to represent minimum performance levels. They're not necessarily indicative of a, of a high level of performance. Um, and I arrange these, these uh, parameters into two filters. So the first filter deals with uh, peak performance, um, and the second one is uh, to do with through life performance of the conversion technology. So using this process um, to uh, screen the technologies, firstly, a technology enters the screening process and it's assessed against the parameters in the first filter. If it clearly doesn't meet a cutoff, um, for one of the parameters in this filter, then it's uh, rejected from the process. Otherwise, it continues um, to the <laughs> it continues to the um, second filter, and it's assessed against the um, second set of parameters. Again, if it doesn't meet it, one of the cutoffs, then it's rejected from the process. Otherwise, it moves on to that um, assessment of the um, research and development requirements, which I talked about earlier. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the results here. Um, I don't have time to go into the um, actual numbers because they won't fit on the, on the slide, um, but I'm happy to discuss these afterwards. So um, this is the results from the first filter. Um, so if we start off with the uh, first technology, dielectrical astomer generators, they met the cutoffs in um, the parameters that I assessed. So they're given an overall um, pass in this filter. The second technology, dielectric fluid generators, um, they meet the cutoff value that I set for conversion efficiency. However, in terms of raw material cost per unit energy, they're kind of borderline around the cutoff that I set. Um, the experimentally demonstrated performance of the technology doesn't meet the cutoff value. However, theoretical modeling would suggest that in theory, um, the performance of the technology would meet the cutoff I set. 
The other technologies, um, they all um, don't meet the cutoff in at least one of the parameters that I assessed, so um, I rejected them from the process at this stage. And then moving on to the second filter, which deals with through life performance. Um, the first thing, um, if we go back to uh, dielectrical astomers again, um, in terms of the uh, through life energy costs, um, they don't meet the cutoff that I set for this parameter. Um, however, it should be noted that there's still a lot we don't understand about the uh, fatigue characteristics of dielectrical astomers. Um, and this is based on a small number of studies, so there's quite a lot of uncertainty um, while they still don't meet the cutoff value. For through life embodied carbon, um, the experimentally demonstrated performance is right around the cutoff, so I gave them a, a borderline assessment. And uh, for the last parameter, ultimate limit state, um, dielectrical astomers are made of highly flexible polymeric materials with very high elongations at break, um, and they also have high electrical breakdown strengths, so they're essentially quite well suited to surviving overloads. Um, the other technology that made it to the second filter, dielectric fluid generators, um, there's a lot less data for this technology. Um, simply, there aren't a lot of uh, studies out there that have um, looked at this technology, and we don't have fatigue life data for it at the moment. There are some reasons to believe its fatigue life might be quite good, um, but we can't assess it with the filter, um, unfortunately. Um, and in terms of ultimate limit state, again, um, it's a technology that should be well suited to surviving overloads. It's made of um, a flexible polymeric material and um, a, a fluid layer. Um, so um, just to kind of summarize the kind of key findings from this, I think we can kind of separate the technologies I looked at into two kind of brackets. So first of all, there are two technologies with kind of high potential um, for, for wave energy applications, being dielectrical astomers and dielectric fluid generators. However, there are still kind of key questions that we need to answer about both of these technologies when we're um, thinking about their use in, in wave energy, kind of uh, particularly around what their actual lifetime is likely to be. Um, and then the other technologies, I think um, we can probably um, kind of, they're more unlikely to be um, viable in wave energy applications because they um, quite um, uh, considerably kind of fail one of the cutoff values that I, I, I set in the screening process. So, um, yeah, I'd like to, to thank you all for listening and um, I'm happy to take any questions now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much, Paul. Do we have any questions for Paul? Mm -hmm. um, do, if you just wait on the, on the microphone. And you I, uh, can just say who you are and where you're from. Uh, Eve Andrews from the University of Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. How did you select the parameters and was there anything that you ruled out and why? Yeah, I mean, there's quite a lot I had to rule out. So basically I went through the assessment processes that exist for uh, wave energy devices and then I looked at things which were actually, you could find a kind of proxy that was measurable for these technologies at an early stage. And then things where I thought you could kind of feasibly set a cutoff um, for. So there are some parameters which, things like the kind of manufacturability, um, it'd be hard to kind of rule a technology in or out based on its manufacturability at the moment um, because a lot of these are kind of small lab scale technologies and we don't know what the manufacturing process will actually look like. Um, yeah, so I guess the kind of two conditions were that it's, it's measurable at an early stage and I might be able to have a bit of a stab at setting a kind of cut off which would be reasonable. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any other questions for, for Paul? <laughs> Thanks, Paul. That was a really interesting mm -hmm. presentation. Jonathan Hodges from Wave Energy Scotland. Um, there's clearly lots of research and development that needs mm -hmm. to be done to bring these technologies forward to make them useful in the sector. But alongside that, you've produced a really valuable screening process and you've applied it once. Um, is, that, is that the screening process done or is there still value in it for the sector mm -hmm. as that R&D progresses? Um, well, th thank you for the question. Um, I'd, I'd hope if... You, if um, I mean, I only was able to run kind of six technologies through the process, um, but hopefully if you kind of had more data for some of these technologies like dielectric fluid generators, the screening process would be a way of kind of um, assessing that and seeing if it changes the, um, the outcome that I got from this, um, or if you, if you found a, a different technology which I hadn't considered. 
Um, yeah, so hopefully it's not the <laughs> um, end of the screening process. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think it's something we can we can repeat as we as we start to get more and more information. Mm -hmm. It will guide us in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and one more from from Brian, <laughs> and this can be the last one in a, an efficiently asked Brian. Okay, Brian Seller, University of Edinburgh. Uh, thanks for the uh, presentation. A quick one then. I'm interested in how things change in time, so I'm wondering how you captured. You, you, you've got to come up with thresholds, yeah, and you've got to come up with some numbers for that. Yeah. So, for example, 0.25 as an efficiency percent. Yeah. Did you look to what they would? Did you project that technology into the future, what it might be, or is it <laughs> just based on knowledge at the moment? Yeah, unfortunately, it's based on knowledge at the moment. Um, so I also, um, which I didn't show on this, I tried to qualify the kind of um, uncertainty in the assessments for each of the parameters as well. Because some of the technologies we have are kind of smaller knowledge based. So we might just understand, we might just have experimental data, but not kind of understanding of what the theoretical maximum performance would be. So for things like DEGS, we understand the theoretical maximum performance really well dielectric fluids not so much so um yeah th there is that uncertainty element as well which i've considered in the kind of stuff i've written but I, I didn't get to present that today um but in general because i've considered things like raw material costs um that should be setting a kind of absolute lower limit on the costs rather than if we're thinking about manufactured costs which will fall a lot over time as we move from a um, an early stage small scale technology to something that's actually manufactured at scale um yeah, so I tried to come up with things which um, should be less affected by that that time thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Paul, and thanks for the questions. Let's move things on. But thank you very much, Paul. Thanks. Okay. So we've heard from from Tidal Energy. We've heard from Novel Solutions for for Wave Energy. Now we're going to move to offshore wind. And we're going to hear from um, Xu Jin Li from the University of, of Dundee, who's going to look at wave interaction on floating devices with up to three turbines. Okay. So, hello everyone. My name is Xu Jin Li. I'm a PhD student from University of Dundee. So today I'm going to introduce the uh, experiments and computations of wave interaction with uh, multiple uh, unit offshore wind turbines. So I will give you a, a short introduction of the multi-unit floating offshore wind turbine first, and then I will introduce the two experiments I conducted. One is for the large-scale experiments, and another is for the small-scale experiments. And at the end, I will uh, give you a short concluding remarks. So nowadays, the attention of the government and the industry have moved from onshore wind to offshore wind. So with the gra gradually mature technology, the um, structure that can host multiple unit uh, wind turbines have uh, received attention in recent years. So to, uh, the aim of the multiple unit of wind turbine is to reduce the cost of the energy production and the maintenance. So to achieve this goal, the distance between the two wind turbines are shortened, but this also causes the main challenge of the multiple unit of, uh, offshore floating offshore wind turbines. Uh, that is, the leading turbine may block the wind against the trailing turbines. And also the uh, mooring system of, of this structure is also very important. So to study this uh, problem, my research have two ways to be conducted. One is for the laboratory experiments, another is to do the computations. And for the laboratory experiments, I did large-scale experiments and small-scale uh, small experiments. For the computations, I, I used the linear potential flow solver, uh, which is called Hydra, and also safety to conduct the computational simulations. And then I will collect data from both sides, and then I will compare the data. So to the uh, large-scale experiments, uh, we study the uh, a equilateral triangular platform with uh, three wind turbines installed at each vertex. And for the mooring system, we use a single point of mooring system. Uh, the the turret bearing can allows the structure to rotate to face the dominant wind direction. And the distance between the two leading turbines are three uh, 2.2 D, which D is the uh, blade swapping area. So that can minimize the uh, turbulence be behind the two leading turbines. 
And the objective of the experiments is to study the response of the large scale model to a combination of waves and wind. And also we want to assess the yaw rotation of the structure and also the effect of the single point mooring system. Um, finally, we want to assess the performance of the single point mooring system. So this is the layout of the experiments. On the left-hand side, we put the model at the center of the wave tank. The, it is a very big wave tank. And we place four cameras of the, Mori, uh, of the motion tracking system around the wave tank. We also have a fan on the, at the top of the picture, uh, which can generate the wind field to the, uh, to the model. Uh, on the right-hand side, we use the cameras ca to capture the uh, motions, and we mount some, some markers on the model that can allow the camera to capture the motions of the markers. So that's basically the system. And uh, so here is where the uh, experiments are uh, conducted. It's in the Harbin Engineering University. And the wave basin, the size is 50 meter times 30 meter times 10 meter in water depth. And we, we can see the model is placed at the center of the wave basin. And the waves are generated from the bottom of the picture and will propagate forward to the wave absor absorber there. And we have a crane to hand the fan which can generate in the uh, wind and the wind velocity and the direction can be adjusted. So here I would like to show you one of the videos during the experiment. Uh, so it is a regular wave and we also create wind in this case. Uh, the wave period is, is 1.6 second, wave height is 0.23 meter. So we can see we started the wind first and the uh, turbine is starting to rotate then the wave maker is generating waves. And then, yes, yeah, so it, the, uh, the model, it has uh, interacting with the waves and uh, the wind. And also, under the model, we have a single point, assist, a single point mooring system to keep the whole structure to be stable. Okay. And apart from the laboratory experiments, we, the linear di diffraction wave theory is used to calculate the motion of the uh, model. So uh, we, the, numer the numerical tool used here is called Hydron. Uh, and uh, we made three assumptions to linearize the problem. We want to simplify it. So we made the assumption of the uh, body motion and the rotations are very small, and the nonlinear wave body interactions are ignored, and the Laplace's equations can govern the flow. And here are some equations to calculate the uh, hydrodynamic load and the aerodynamic load. So we use a uh, boundary element method to calculate the hydrodynamic load, and also the uh, blade, moment, blade, blade element momentum theory to calculate the uh, aerodynamic loads. By combining those three equations, we got the governing equations of the motion as shown in equation four here. So here I would like to show you one of the comparison in time series. Uh, here I show uh, the motions in surge, heave, and pitch. And these are two different wave conditions here. So after the uh, large scale experiments, I also did some uh, small scale experiments in in here in University of Dundee. So be because the continuous restriction on the international traveling, so a, a series of small scale experiments was conducted here. Uh, we have a wave flume. Uh, the length is 12 meter and the width is 0 0.6 meter. Uh, the water depth is 0 0.3 meter. So we want to uh, study the motion of the small scale model to the combination of waves and current here. And here is a layout of how, how, how we set up the model. We place the model at the center of the wave flume. We generate the waves and also current from left-hand side to right-hand side. And we use three catenary mooring lines to keep the model to be stable. And here we also use the uh, motion tracking system to capture the motions on the model. And we have three wave gauges to measure the uh, water elevation uh, behind and also before the models. 
And here the picture shows the passive maker we mounted on the model, and that, that is a lateral view of the setup of the uh, experiment. So here I also want to show you a video on how this, uh, during one of the case. So there's a waves and also current uh, propagating from left hand side to right hand side, and wave period is 1.5 seconds, and the wave height is 0 0.03 meter. And similarly, we also use the hydron to calculate the motions of the, um, of the model. So we can see, this is also show the motion in surge, heave, and pitch. And we see there a, shows a good agreement between those uh, two results, between those two approaches. And last, I'll give you a very short conclusion. So uh, the experiments and the computations are conducted to study the uh, performance of the uh, uh, multi-unit floating offshore wind turbines, and the uh, two results are be compared. So the, perf mm, so the potential flow solver hydron is used to calculate the motions uh, of the object, and also, um, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, and also the results shows a good re agreement. And that's all for my presentation. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Susan. Very interesting and very good use of, of videos. So do we have any question for, questions for Susan? Hi. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, it's uh, well, Paul Carey, University of Edinburgh. <laughs> um, so um, I was wondering, it, it looked like the agreement was much better in the small model um, between the experimental results and your modeling than the large model. Yeah. I was uh, wondering why that was. Um, well, uh, during the large scale model, uh, we, for some cases, we made some mistakes. So there's a calibration issue. So uh, maybe the, the data is not very useful for that. But uh, uh, as we get the experiments from the large scale experiments, the small scale experiments get more like, confidence. So that data is more uh, trusted. So th that shows a better agreement between the data. And Alistair? Alistair McDonald from Edinburgh University. Thank you very much for the, the presentation. I, I don't know very much about tank, tank testing and, and mixed floating things and, and, and turbines, but there could be some real challenges in sc scaling down the, the wet stuff and the, and the aerodynamic stuff and then applying those rotor forces. Um, how did you approach that, that challenge for the, the work that you're doing at Harbin? Um, what, how, how did you scale down that NREL 5 megawatt design so that it produced those uh, rotor loads? Mm. So by using, uh, so by scaling the model down for the hydrodynamic part, we use the Reynolds scaling law but it is, cannot be used for the aerodynamic part. So we are using the, oh sorry, uh, I missed that. So for, for the, for the uh, hydrodynamic part, we use the fluid scaling law, but for the aerodynamic part, we use the uh, Reynolds scaling law. And we need to measure the thrust force on the blade so to make sure it, the force is scaling down uh, correctly. So that's how we scale the model down. Yeah. Hope this can answer your question. <laughs> Okay. Any other questions? Let's take this one at the front. Hi, um, I'm Katie from University of Edinburgh. Um, I was wondering, did you compare the results from your large-scale and small-scale experimental work? And if you did, like, how, how did they compare? Mm. Actually, I haven't tried that, but that's a very interesting point. Um, yeah, I, I, I can, I will try that. The, uh, and show, see how, how it works. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, sorry, Jonathan, we will move on just to finishing things off, but do um, in, in, engage during the, the coffee break. So thank you um, very, very much, Susan. Very, very interesting. Thanks again. Thank you. Now, 
Um, so we've had three presentations so far. So we've heard about sort of you know tidal technologies, wave technologies, uh, and, and offshore wind. And able to be able to progress any of these, we do need to understand the resource that they're having to, to deal with. And so our next presentation is from Aaron Kumar from the University of Dundee, who's going to tell us about current current interaction and the effect that it has on waves. Aaron, over to you. Um, thank you, Dr. Jeffrey. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron uh, Kumar. I am a PhD student at the University of Dundee. I'm working with uh, Dr. Masood Hayat Dawadi. Um, the overall theme of my PhD is to study uh, numerically the uh, interaction between waves, currents, and winds with offshore structure. In today's presentation, I'll be focusing on a part of that, which is uh, current interaction with nonlinear shallow water waves. So first I'll go through the motivation of why uh, we need, uh, why we chose to look into this problem. Um, uh, people who may have been, um, at, may have attended last year's um, session might remember, unlikely, but might remember that I uh, worked on something similar where I looked at the, the wave current interaction in deep water. Uh, so it is uh, quite different and we'll get to why, we, uh, why I chose to look into this. Then I'll go over the methodology that I use, which is uh, CFD, and um, uh, the pertaining theory, I'll discuss that as well. And then we'll go over the, the study that I've conducted and I'll look, delve into the uh, major results and some conclusions. So uh, the first thing is that uh, when it comes to shallow waters, the, it is generally observed that the currents are much stronger. Also, the wave itself, shallow water waves, they behave qu uh, quite differently when compared to deep water waves. The particle movement itself is, is quite different. So it stands to reason that the interaction between those, uh, the, the, those particles with, with currents would yield a different uh, change in the, in, in, in the wave itself. Also, um, there's a wave current interaction in, in coastal region. It, it affects uh, how, uh, the movement of po pollutants and, and sediment transport. And predicting, being able to predict how the wave changes in the presence of current um, gives us a better idea of um, analyzing the impact it may have on a structure. And uh, over the course of this study, I've also found that uh, there was a, 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 a lack of um, concentrated studies where shallow water wave current interactions were observed in particular. So the methodology that I use is, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is to use finite volume method to solve the Navier-Stokes equations, which is the governing equation for, um, for my case. Um, I use an open source CFD toolbox, uh, namely OpenFOAM, to run my simulations. Um, I generate the wave on one end of the domain, and the wave currents set up is, um, uh, is uh, practically uh, included uh, by a linear superposition at the inlet relaxation zone, which is the zone where the wave is created. And then uh, at the outlet relaxation zone, the, the same uh, current is applied so that the wave is absorbed at, at the outlet. Um, I have uh, considered several uh, different waves by systematically changing the wave height and wave length. I'll get to those later. And uh, I've studied the wave profile, surface elevation, pressure, and horizontal particle velocity, and how these parameters change when the wave interacts with the current. So here is the general setup of, uh, of my numerical wave current tank. On the left, we have the inlet relaxation zone that I mentioned before, where I have a linear superposition of uh, the wave velocities and the current velocities. And then once these, uh, the perturbations are uh, just initiated, and then the water is allowed to move freely into the domain. And uh, at the, on the right, we have the absorption zone. Um, once I had the wave current tank set up, I also looked at comparing the, my, my numerical tank with existing uh, experiments. And as we can see, it shows good agreement here. I have the horizontal particle velocity distribution, so basically the velocity profile under the wave crest and under the wave trough. And we see that uh, the numerical, my numerical, uh, Navier-Stokes model, my numerical simulations agree well with other computations and the experiments conducted previously. Uh, so when it uh, comes to the specific study that I ran, I had five shallow water waves. I maintained the water depth constant. And uh, the waves, wave cases was chosen such that for three of them, the wave length remains constant and the wave height is halved. 
And in other three, the wave height remains constant and the wavelength is halved. So what this does is it lets me isolate the effect of each of these parameters when I'm looking at the uh, output. And for the currents, I looked at the different uh, experiments and um, studies conducted and uh, the literature, based on the literature, uh, the, I saw the, the general trend that is observed when it comes to um, the different current velocities and the current profiles that are used. And based on that, I chose three current profiles. One is custom current profile, which follows a uniform profile from the uh, sea floor to the wave tank floor to a mid uh, water depth and then a linear profile later. The second is a shear current profile which prof uh, follows a linear profile throughout the water depth and the uniform current profile does not change with water depth. <clears throat> Moving to the results, um, we, we look at first, we start with surface elevation. So here I have the surface elevation for five different wave cases that I chose. Um, the blue is the wave only case and then red is wave and following current and then we have black wave and opposing current. And I have also zoomed into the peaks of each of the wave cases and we see clearly that a following current in general, it increases the, the surface elevation uh, and a, an opposing current, it, it decreases the same. And when it comes to looking at the wave profile here, what I, uh, what I have done, in fact, from here onwards, the, we have this vertical axis would have the prime values. So it's lambda prime, h prime. So prime uh, values, these are essentially the percentage increase or the decrease in these parameters with respect to a wave only case. So here we see that let's say lambda prime is around 10% and minus 10% for 10% for around fo uh, following currents and minus 10% for uh, opposing currents. So it means that there was, again, the, when, when the wave interacted with the following current, there was, uh, the wave was stretched by 10% and there was an increase in the wavelength of about 10%. Another interesting thing is that we see that um, this change in la wavelength is, uh, remains invariant with the wave, the, in, the wave height of the incident wave or the wavelength of the incident wave. Second is again now H prime. Here we are looking at the change in wave height. Here we see that there are, uh, are some differences as the wave height increases and also as the wavelength increases, but in general the trend remains the same that a falling current is increasing the wave height and opposing current decreases the same. <clears throat> then the third parameter that I studied was the horizontal particle velocity. So here it's, uh, uh, here we see two interesting things. The one is that the, the actual magnitude of change is, is much larger than what we observed in wave, uh, length of wave height. Um, this actually makes sense because when, when, when I look at the um, um, the, the current, the, the horizontal particle velocity under the wave crest in case of the wave alone, those values are actually quite close to the current velocity I've chosen here. So it makes sense that the, when, when, when I impose this additional cu current, which, which, whose values are close to the wave velocities, the, the, the total change is actually much larger compared to, uh, let's say, wave, um, a change in wavelength or change in wave height. And also as we approach uh, larger waves and longer waves, we see that the effect of the cu current on the wave is also seems to be diminishing. And uh, lastly here, uh, when we look at, I have looked at the pressure. And again, the, the trend remains to be the same that the following current uh, registers an increase in, in pressure while uh, a far, an opposing current decreases the same. Um, I should have pointed out earlier that the, 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 even though I have considered three different currents in the, in the study, um, the, the results that we just saw were all for the custom profile, so it would have a, a uniform profile for up to a certain water depth and then a linear profile thereafter. So the major conclusions that I made was that uh, a following current, uh, it almost always increases the wave height, wavelength, surface elevation, horizontal particle velocity, and the pressure. Uh, the change in wavelength is found to be independent of the wave height and wavelength of the incident wave that, um, or the wave only case that interacts with the current. Um, horizontal particle velocity, as we saw, of large, uh, larger and longer waves, it appears to be weakly influenced by the current interaction. 
Um, a, a quite a peculiar interesting uh, thing was that the wave height was observed to be increasing with following current and decreasing with opposing current. I've run several other uh, cases and comparisons with experiments where we see the opposite. So, where, so I have a, uh, achieved an agreement with uh, literature in, in those cases. And um, I, what I've, I've found that this is uh, actually this behavior appears to be dependent on the wave type and the current type that I've chosen. So right now we have uh, detailed a numerical study focusing on this behavior and uh, we are running those simulations to see if we can figure out uh, in a comprehensive way what might be causing this or if there's more story to tell. <coughs> in the next phase of the project, uh, I would be including wind into the domain. And then finally, I would be running um, a, a combined simulation for wave current and wind interaction with offshore structure. I've already completed wave and uh, object interactions and wave current and object interactions are in the pipes as we speak. So the next step would be wave, wind, and uh, current interaction with offshore structures. Yeah, that's about it for me, and thank you. OK, thank you very much, Arn. Very interesting and very well thank covered. You. Do we have any questions for Arn? Well, there must be some experts in wave current interaction. Brian. <laughs> yeah, Brian Seller, University of Edinburgh again. Thanks very much uh, for the presentation. It's, it's, I don't think it's too technical. Um, it's more about your experience of using OpenFoam. Um, we're yeah. interested in lots of different simulation tools. Um, how long has it taken you to get to these results? I think you said you presented uh, last year. Yeah. And the second question, I'll, I'll be cheeky. Uh, how long does the simulation itself take uh, to get you know, on a per run basis? Right, so how long has it, OpenFoam has, does have a learning curve, so it does, like, especially my, I would say that I was not so much into numerical, so it, it did take me a while, I would say about a year, but uh, uh, the second part was, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the second part was just simulation runtime. Yeah, runtime, so yeah, that, that again, it depends on the, the, the mesh that I've, so, so I've run conver convergence studies, and uh, what I found that I, I need a certain number of cells per wave height, so that's my defining parameter, and then I scale that to other, other regions. And in general, these simulations, they take about um, 12 hours. Now, I run these on a supercomputer cluster, so there are 64 cores. So they are quite, quite heavy computationally, I would say, yeah. Thanks, Brian. Any other questions for, for Arden? Anything from the ID core contingent? Okay, maybe I, I can ask yeah. one. Um, I, I'm interested, you know, clearly you've done a lot of work here to get it to this stage. Who do you think the, the main audience for your results are? Right. Um, I think based uh, overall, um, eventually when I also would have the wind into the, uh, when I would have that into the domain, I think anyone who works in offshore, um, um, uh, you know, in, uh, offshore industry would, would be a, a target audience. But right now, as of, the, as of the moment, I think it's people who are more into computations or, or, or experimental studies of wave and current interactions that would be the, like, the, the target audience because uh, there are uh, still like a lot of open questions, so it would be interesting to um, present these to them and, and see what, what sort of response it generates. Great, thank you. Okay, I, I think we'll draw things to uh, a close here. So that's the end of the, the offshore session. I think we've had four you know, very interesting, well-delivered um, presentation, both on wave, tidal, offshore wind, and the, and the overall resource. So thanks again to the, the four speakers for the presentations and for the, and for the Q&A. Um, thanks to the audience for providing th those, those questions. Um, so I think we need to be back in the main room in four minutes time for the next keynote speech. Hopefully that, that's running to, to time, which is Adrian Gillespie, um, the CEO of Scottish Enterprise. So I'm sure that will be interesting. But thanks again to Arne and thanks again to all the other speakers.